to Bethel Life. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, all over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit by changing lives. One way we help to change lives is through our giving. Today is our sowing seed offering. This month, we're supporting our church family in Ecuador to help the ministry there continue to thrive as they face difficult challenges with their government's COVID protocols. Please keep our church family in Ecuador lifted up in prayer and thank you for making a difference through your giving. Next Sunday night, we're going to celebrate water baptism at the lake. The baptism is going to be held at Chestnut Run Swim Beach at Lake Shenango and will start at 6 p.m. Please come celebrate with us as members of our church family are being baptized. Sunday, September 5th is right around the corner and you'll want to mark your calendar for this volunteer event at the campground from 4 o'clock until 8 o'clock p.m. This event is for everyone who serves and everyone who is considering serving at Bethel. Bring your family and celebrate with us. There will be games, bouncers, prizes, chicken, and more. We are excited to see you there. For a complete list of everything happening at Bethel Life, please visit our calendar on our church app or on our website at blwc.org. Thank you for joining us. Here at Bethel, you are family, and we're glad to worship with you. Amen. Well, hey, listen, we are glad to be worshiping with you. Welcome out this morning, church family. Hey, turn to somebody and say good morning. If you, if you haven't done that yet, there you go. Hey, listen, if you're a first-time visitor to Bethel Life, we want to welcome you. There's two ways that you can acknowledge your visit today. In front of you in the seat back pocket, you'll see an orange car. You can fill that out for us, and as you exit the building, turn right, and uh, you can stop by our guest services building. Second of all, if you text hello to 724-589-5433, you can also acknowledge your visit today. We just want to make a connection with you. We're just glad that you're here. Trust the Word of God ministers to your heart. Also, you'll notice today in our announcements, we made the, the announcement that today is our sowing seed offering. Well, actually, it's always the last Sunday of the month. But listen, if you brought your offering today, it won't be refused. Actually, you can give all month long to sowing seed. So if you've not been a part of that, we'd invite you to join us in supporting the missions work that we're doing around the globe. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning as we open in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come to you right now, Lord, we thank you so much for all the things you've done for us. And Lord, as we prepare ourselves to enter into the worship and into the word, I thank you, Lord, that our hearts will be changed today. May we go away from this place uplifted, encouraged, set free. May we go from this place recognizing the importance of each and every one of us being a light in our communities. And Father, I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.
rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Lord, today we give you all glory. We give you all praise. We give you all honor forever. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Forever, forever, forever.
with me tonight or this afternoon, this morning. I see, Lord, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see the promises in fulfillment all over my life. Time I see, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. And why should I fear? And why should I fear? For oh, the evidence is here. Why should I fear? For oh, the evidence is here. Lord, today we thank you that the evidence is here and the evidence is clear. You know, in the first service this morning, and we want to welcome our online family. You guys are awesome. Thank you for being a part of our worship celebration. Hope you're enjoying um, the presence of the Lord wherever you're at today. And I know I said tonight, but that's because somebody's watching in Asia and it's nighttime there. So that was just for you. And then I said this afternoon, that's because somebody's in England watching and that one was just for you. <laughs> And then finally, you know, at the home crowd, we get to the morning because we always prefer others, right? You see, there's always a way out. Whew. I'm just so used to doing music at nighttime. Everything's a night. But it's, it's good. This, in the first service, I was sharing that, you know, when you... How many of you have ever read a scripture in the Bible and then all of a sudden you read it for the 84th time and then you understand it? Okay, so in... Bible school world, that's called illumination. It's like you flip a light bulb on. That's just what it is, illumination. Your, your, your brain goes, ooh, I never saw that before. So, listen, you, this, is a real, this is an awesome song, straight Bible. It's powerful. But, you know, the verse, I mean, the, the words in the chorus, they really are true. And I want you to listen to them for what they say. It says, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life. And when we were singing the first service, you know, I was illuminated to the truth that many times as believers, we want the promise right now. But this is so powerful. It says, I see your promises in fulfillment. So can I just encourage you today, wherever you're at today, tomorrow's going to be better. And that if God's given you a promise and it hasn't happened yet, it's on the way. Is that okay? I mean, I... Pastor Jim's preaching today, so I don't want to get it cranked up, but this is really good stuff right here, PJ. And um, so whatever you're holding on to, and you know, I was sitting out here at second service, and I get to look at all of you guys as we do, and man, you were ripping that violin, girl. <laughs> I gave her lessons on Thursday. Um, so I look over here, and so I didn't ask permission for this, but I'm just going to do it. So I see Marissa Baptiste over here, right? And um, for some reason, I see a lot of her Facebook posts. You know, because you never know how Facebook works, right? You can be best friends with somebody and never see their stuff. But I see yours all the time. And I see your testimonies of how you've seen the promises of God fulfilled in your life step by step. Where you've had bad days and you've had good days, but you're on the progression upward. Right? Is it, amen? Did I put, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I didn't even ask her permission, so I hope I don't get in trouble. So I'm going to cut out early. Um, but... She's a wonderful example is what I want to say. I have seen her testimonies on Facebook change because the promises of God are being fulfilled in her life, and that's for everybody. That's for everybody. I'm so excited this afternoon because I'm going to get a promise fulfilled. Um, I'm really pumped up about it because to, this afternoon is the back-to-school bash. Okay, Pastor Andrew, now listen to me. That thing's going to be mega. They've got 
rappers. Chris is taking the band out there and doing some music, games. They're dunking teachers. I, Miss Mitchell, are you going down? Miss Mitchell is going down, baby. I may come out just for that and throw some balls. But it, it's going to be an incredible event to launch our kids back into schools and also to share the gospel with them. So it's going to be a great, great day. It's out of the campground. It's 4 to 8 tonight. Um, so I'm pumped up about it. So Lauren was in this morning going, man, I, I'm playing with Chris this afternoon, and Rob's out there helping, and we've got to look for somebody to keep the baby. I've been asking since that kid was born, could I babysit him? How old is he? One. One. So this afternoon, a promise is being fulfilled. She's been telling me for one year, I'm going to let you keep him. So I'm in my mind, and all the guys in the band this morning at 730 are going, dude, you're crazy. I said, I've raised three kids. I can handle this. No problem. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, Holly will be there. Now listen, between services, I saw Holly, I said, mm, we're babysitting Brady this afternoon, four to eight. She goes, you're babysitting. I'm serving at the campground. <laughs> Me and Brady, baby. But my point being, it's funny, get you laughing this morning. You know, you, you've been telling me forever. Yeah, I'm going to let you keep him sometime. I'm going to let and I've been looking forward to it. I like that little fellow. So it's a promise being fulfilled, okay? And I know it's a funny example, but the reality is that's how God works in our lives. You know, you look at somebody like Mar Marissa and, and, right? Yeah, okay. And um, you, you, I just watched the promises fulfilled her life. It, she's, you're an encouragement for me, whether you know it or not. And um, then, yeah. So wherever you're at, Whatever promise you're waiting on for the Lord, I promise you, he will be right on time. And you can put it in the bank that whatever and whoever Scripture says you are and what you are, that is exactly who you are. Amen?
Father, we thank you for the privilege we have together in the place of worship today in your house to acknowledge who you are and all that you have done for us. Father, we thank you that because of Jesus Christ today, we stand confident, bold in your presence. We know that we are accepted, that we are loved, and Father, that we are continuously being transformed into the very image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We've been accepted and redeemed. Lord, we thank you for the process of becoming like Christ. And Lord, in this place, every need that we have is met, even as we've been encouraged through this time of worship. Your fulfillment of your promises are evident in our lives continuously, day by day, moment by moment, as we trust in you. Lord, we just thank you for the privilege we have of gathering as the body of Christ worshiping you and then receiving the seed of your word today. Just want to take a moment. Pastor Jim is going to be bringing the word today, but before we transition to that time, I just felt like I wanted to lead the congregation in prayer over a couple of very significant things. Uh, of course, we all have watched the news and understand that the brothers and sisters in the Lord there in Afghanistan are going through a very traumatic time right now. And it really it's important for us as the church to remember those around the world, our own communities. And want to pray for them. want to pray for the body of Christ. want to pray for the people, whether they're believers or not. No matter what faith they believe in, we want to pray for the people in Afghanistan. We need to pray for the leaders around this world. And even the leadership right now in Afghanistan. To do what is right. And then uh, some of you may be aware that there was some tremendous flooding in the state of Tennessee this weekend. The significance of that is this, that uh, you know we've been talking about Hope Center Ministries for uh, months here, and we're closing on the house this week so that we can open up our own Hope Center here in uh, the greater Greenville area. Excited about that opportunity. But the birthplace of Hope Center Ministries is actually in Waverly, Tennessee. Waverly, Tennessee is a little community of 3,500 people that was wiped out yesterday by flooding. We have been in communication with Pastor Josh and Stephen and others who are there and have seen photos. It's been quite devastating. In fact, in the first service, Reverend Terry was with us and he is over, you know, our disaster relief program and they're looking right now deploying our mobile feeding kitchen on site. That's to be determined, but they're on standby right now so that we can respond our Hope Center people, because of the location, the center there is okay, but homes and lives have been devastated through this flooding. And I thought, what greater opportunity for us to join in them and pray for them and uh, all that's being done there for the good folks of Waverly. So I just invite you, before we minister the word, let's pray today. Let's petition the Lord today with our hearts gathered together, whether you're in person or joining us online. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming before your throne of grace today. Lord, you said this in your word. You said, my house should be called a house of prayer for all of the nations. So with our hearts extended to you today and our petition of prayer for you is for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for God, the, the citizens, the men, the women, the boys, the children in Afghanistan today, regardless of their faith, regardless of their religion, Father, we pray for your protection upon them. But we especially today, God, we pray for the body of Christ there. Where the light has been shining and lives are being changed. Today, those that are being uh, abused, those that are being neglected, those that are being targeted, Lord, by this new regime. Father, we pray today that your grace and your peace would rest supernaturally upon them. Father, we pray for leaders around the world. We pray that there would be a proper response and then we pray for the hearts of those that are leading today on this attack, this assault. God, we pray that you would move upon their hearts, that you would open their eyes of understanding. That you would fill them with compassion. Lord, we just pray for this nation. We pray for the people. And Lord, we pray for the church of Afghanistan, the body of Christ. And then Lord, we also pray for our brothers 
and our sisters in Waverly, Tennessee, and places that have been impacted by this flooding. Lord, we, have, we especially pray for the residents of this community, those that are first responders, those that are reaching out and today attempting to assess damage and bring to restore life and services to this community. We pray for our own disaster relief team and other organizations that are responding today in Waverly. We pray for your protection emotionally and spiritually, physically of those who've been impacted directly by this flood. We pray that you would protect them, minister to them. And again, we pray for the church body there. What an opportunity then in this midst of devastation for the church to rise up and serve and be the light that you created us to be. I pray for Reverend Terry. We pray for Bill and Gordon and others that are a part of this Jerusalem team. We think that you give them wisdom as they choose and, and to get, navigate how to best respond to come alongside of this community. And we thank you for your grace that is ever present for us each and every day. Father, thank you for hearing our hearts cry today. And Lord, now we just ask simply that you prepare our hearts to receive the seed of your word. That no matter where we are today as we receive the word of God coming to us, it will bring freedom and transformation because of the power that is in your spoken word. Pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Ken. Thank you, Pastor Greg and the worship team. We appreciate you guys. And uh, ditto to what Pastor Greg just shared, as well as invite you to look at some of Marissa's posts. That's the end of today's message. You can see, come back next week. Uh, but no, isn't it, it's amazing how God works through a service and every we, we may not realize this but every part of the service is directed by the holy spirit and there's something that someone can take even with what pastor greg was saying there there's something there that ministered to somebody's heart today you needed to hear that and i'm so appreciative of the lord and how he does that it still amazes me after all these years how one sermon coming out of one person's mouth can affect so many different people in different areas of their life at the same time. Amen? We want to welcome our online audience as well. We're so glad that you're able to be with us today. And uh, I'm just about ready to ask some questions, and you can respond as well with a thumbs up uh, on Facebook there. And uh, how many people have been in church for at least 10 years? Raise your hand. If you've been in church 10 years, okay. All right, we're going to keep moving. How many of you have been in church for 20 years? 20 years, okay. How about 30 years? You've been in church 30 years. All right. How about 40? 40 years you've been in church. Uh, the crowd's getting smaller. How about 50 years? All right, here we go. The next one, 60 years. How are you folks not in heaven? I'm just teasing with you. Uh, <coughs> just teasing with you. But you know what? One of the things that I think we, we can all agree on, those that have been in the church for quite a while, is that the terminology in our society, in our world, has changed. And the way we present, the gospel's even presented different. You know, we've got so many things at our fingertips now that we didn't have before to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And as I was thinking about my message today, I was thinking about what it was like. Uh, I got saved. Marcia invited me to church. Uh, back, I was 16 years old. The church was across the street in the parking lot, the upper parking lot there. And so I came to church. And again, I came to church for the wrong reasons. I didn't come to hear a holy message from God. I came to see the girl. Uh, but what was, what happened to me is, is I'm sort of like if you play around in a muddy creek bank long enough, you're going to slip in, right? You're going to fall into the creek. And so I accepted Christ at 16 and called into the ministry at the age of 17 and headed off to Bible college in Oklahoma City uh, at the age of 18. So I was not really familiar with church. I, I wasn't familiar with the terminology and so forth that church has. And uh, one of the things that was required of us as a ministerial student is we had to travel. And, and we traveled within the conference there, which encompassed the states of uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas and Texas. And as we did that, we were required to go, and they, we had a, a coordinator, and he would set up preaching assignments for us at different locations, and we'd go and preach. And I can remember back in those days, uh, we had three services per week. You had a Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. 
And Sunday night and Wednesday night often was an opportunity for testimonies. You know what I mean by testimony? You share what God has done for you. And uh, I can remember, you know, and again, this was, I didn't care where I was, whether it was in Oklahoma or whether I was in Arkansas, I was in Kansas, the testimonies were all very similar. Pastor would ask, who has a testimony to share tonight? Somebody would pop up. I just want to thank the Lord tonight that I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And people would tell, glory to God, we're excited for you, brother. You know, they, they were, it was exciting. And if they were really spiritual, they would always tack on the end of, this, of that testimony, and I'm on my way to heaven. Oh, that would get Sister Kick up, something to shout about there. But, you know, it was funny, because I, but the one that always got me was the person would stand up, and they would say this. Y'all pray for me that I hold out to the end. Again, I wasn't real familiar with church, so I didn't know if they were in the middle of it, like selling their home and they wanted to get more money out of it. So that, but again, what it meant was they prayed, were asking for prayer, that they would be successful in their Christian walk throughout their whole life. So uh, kind of interesting. You don't hear that too much. Of course, back then, uh, it was not uncommon at times for the pastor to get up and say, you know what? Tonight, I'm going to exegete John 3, 16. And in your mind, you're thinking, oh, no, you're not. You're not going to do anything to that verse of Scripture. I appreciate it. But exegete simply means to interpret what it says. So, you know, you think about today, and, and some of the terms we'll hear today, and I remember when this one came on the scene, the church must be relevant. So I had to look it up. What in the world does that mean? You know, what are we, what are we, I mean, is that like we have cooties and we've got to get rid of them? Or what's the problem here? And, you know, what it, it talks about this, that we, your ministry needs to make a difference in people's lives, and lives need to, need to be changed. So, oh, okay, that makes sense. All right, and then now we've got people coming up, you say, you know what, we're so glad that you're with us this morning, and we're going to unpack John 3.16. Well, I didn't know it was packed up. Who put it in a suitcase? Of course, we were very familiar with the term burdens, and you don't really hear that too much. A lot of folks don't understand what burdens are, and, and, and it's not your wife or your kids, so put that out of your mind right now, but... We hear the term baggage now, do we not? Baggage. This morning I want to minister a message to you called baggage, question mark. It's t time to unload. It's time to unload. Listen, whether we've had a troubled childhood, we've had a f bad marriage, or whether we've had a silver spoon in our mouth from the time of birth, we all deal with baggage in our lives. And what we don't realize at times is that if we don't get rid of that baggage, it will affect our relationships, it will affect the direction of our life, and it will affect what we do. And uh, this morning, that's what I want to share about. And I've got a short video clip that I'd like to show you concerning baggage. We've all got it. You've heard the saying, He's carrying a lot of baggage from his past, or avoid her. Baggage. But think about it. I mean, baggage, it's, we get it from other people, the things that they do to us or say to us. And if we carry those memories around, in essence, we carry baggage. We begin collecting baggage when we're just little kids. There you are. Hey, 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 hey I need to talk to you. Yeah, what? Well, um, we were talking about building the, the tree house. Yeah, yeah. I, I love tree houses. Yeah, it's just a thing. Um, see, you can't help us build the tree house. Why? Well, you don't really want me to tell you. Yeah, I do. Okay, well, we were talking, uh -huh. um, um, the gang, we were talking, and yeah. um, well, you're too fat. What? You'll weigh down the treehouse. I'm not fat. Yes. No, no, yes. I'm not. No, no. Uh, mommy just says I'm big boned. Dinosaurs are big boned. You're fat. No, no, no. Mommy says I'm chunky. <laughs> Peanut butter's chunky. You're fat. No, 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 no. M mommy says that I've lost weight. I think you found it. No, no, no. Mommy says I'm just different. <laughs> Your mommy says you're just different? Yeah, I'm just different. <laughs> go back to where you came from. I gotta go. Bye. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's one of the biggest lies we teach children. Words hurt, 
they cut deep. And if we carry around the words of other people, essentially what we do is we're collecting baggage. See, we can't, we can't find our self-worth based on what other people think of us. We have to find our self-worth based on Christ and our relationship with Him. But it doesn't seem to be that easy. And as life goes on and we get older, we just tend to collect more baggage. Sometimes we pick up baggage from people who are very close to us, like a best friend. No, I, I know. I know, Shelly. I know. It's like we talked for three hours and it seemed like five minutes. I know, I know, I know. It's like we have this amazing connection, this chemistry. Okay, I'm just going to say this, Shelly. I've never said this to anyone in a really long time. Um, but I, Shelly, I feel like you're, you're my density. I really, really do. Hmm? No, I, you're right. You're my, you're my destiny. That's what I meant. You're my destiny, right. I'm just so full. Hey, he's right here. I got to go. Okay, bye. Hey, buddy, what's up? How much are you talking to? Um, um, talking to my mom. Your mom's your destiny. Yeah, yeah, I mean, she gave birth to me and everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, kudos. Really? Yeah. Because it sounds like you said Shelly. Yeah, um, that's her, that's her name. I thought your mom's name was Kelly. That's her middle name. Your mom's name's Kelly Shelly? Yeah, yeah, and she was picked on a lot when she was a kid, so I just really tried to encourage her all the time and tell her that I love her. What's wrong with that? Okay, I mean, okay, great thing uh, whatever, do. whatever. Did you talk to my Shelly? Yeah, I did. Um, and? She's not, she's not gonna be your Shelly. What? Look, we just started talking. We just, we just kind of hit it off. I mean, it just happened. I mean, what? we have this great chemistry. It just. Uh, no, 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 no. You were supposed to call her for me. I did. I started out doing that. I did. You no. gotta believe me. You're supposed to be my best friend. I, I am. Don't, don't let a girl come between us, okay? This I is not a big. You did this. Look, man, you know I've liked her since we were in kindergarten, and you were supposed to talk to her for me. Yes, but, but I've been your best friend since kindergarten, and we've always said growing up, best friends forever, right? Yeah, well, you know what? Forever just got a lot shorter. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's a You did this. You're supposed to be my best friend. And our friends, they're just trying to get through life the same way we are and sometimes they're gonna make poor choices and we can either learn to forgive them or we can pick up more baggage you know the truth about baggage is we don't need other people to load it on us we do a pretty good job of dumping baggage on ourselves when we compare ourselves to others we think things like, oh, if I could be as popular as they are, if I could be as gifted and talented as they are, but I'm not, I I'm a loser, I'm no good. And when we think that, we pick up more baggage. Or we find ourselves thinking, they have it made. And why is life so easy for them and so hard for me? I'm never gonna make it. When we buy into that lie, more baggage. And sometimes, sometimes we pick up baggage from people who love us dearly. They just don't realize that their words cut like a knife. Son. Hey, Dad. What happened out there? Uh, um, the ball slipped. The, the lights got in my eyes. It was... The lights got in your eyes? Yeah. You know that's what costs us the game, don't you? Yeah. The ball slipped. How many times have I gotten up in the morning before 5 a.m. before I go to work to work on the stuff with you, huh? There were scouts out there. You realize that? Dad, the ball slipped. The ball slipped. It did. I mean, what, what do you want? Hey, coach. Huh? No. <laughs> Butterfingers, yeah. <laughs> we're going to work with them. Uh-huh. All right. See you later. Are you crying? No. Well, don't. Pull it together. People are watching. I want you to grab your stuff. I'm going to go to the car and I'll meet you there, all right? Dad, I'm just disappointed in you, all right? These were our dreams, right? Grab your stuff. And our parents, they don't mean to hurt us. 
It's just, they've got their own baggage. And when you don't deal with baggage, you pass it on. And for us, we have to learn to find our self-worth only in our relationship with Christ. And if we don't, we pick up more baggage. It gets uncomfortable, tedious. And our natural tendency is to want to dump this baggage onto someone else, but it always backfires. It always backfires. Let me ask you something. Can anybody associate with what you just saw? In our life, when we begin to look at our life, we have two paths, two trails behind us. We have a trail of failures and we have a trail of successes. Now, when we look at the trail of failures that, uh, you know, it's unfulfilled dreams, it's times we've been unsuccessful, it's a hurt, it's a habit, it's a hang-up, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a conversation, words we said we wish we could take back, and that is not possible. And you see, that's the path that the enemy will always try to drag us down. He always wants to drag us down the path of failures. God, on the other hand, always wants to point out our successes, the time we were victorious the time that we were able to overcome, the time that we said the right thing at the right moment and it changed the situation, it changed the direction. You know, each of us face different things in life. And some people struggle with alcohol addiction. That was never a problem for me. I didn't consume alcohol in high school. Uh, didn't take drugs either, didn't go down that path. I saw people that walked down those paths and it affected my life forever. I just determined I would never touch that stuff because I saw what it would do to a human being. But you know, what I found out in my life is the, the path that the enemy tries to get me hooked into and in following is the fat path of failure. I was a, uh, <clears throat> I was known, we, we grew up first few years of our lives in the North Hills of Pittsburgh. And uh, was part of, we went to school at Franklin Park School. And, uh, for me, I was a little bit chunky back then. As the said at the beginning, maybe big bone. I'm not real sure. But, you know, the kids would call me Fat Fleck. And I wasn't tubby. I mean, I, I don't remember how much I weighed. I uh, probably forgot that intentionally. But, in a, and again, for me, my issue was I was always, because I was like that, I was very unathletic. I, I was the last person picked for kickball, uh, I was sort of like Charlie Brown and Lucy type of scenario, you know, I always miss the ball and uh, or softball, if we were playing softball, they, I would be the last one and it was like the teams would fight over who wasn't going to get me. So, and we don't think about things like that as children, we don't think about how that affects us, but one of the things that it did for me is it drove me the opposite direction where I made, determined that I was going to be better in my mind. So as I continued to get older and mature, I began to develop myself athletically. And when I graduated from high school, I received the Presidential Fitness Award, and uh, it was pretty cool. I was pretty excited about that. More push-ups, more sit-ups, more long jumps, all that stuff you could do. But I had achieved that level athletically in my life. And I believe what drove me was baggage I didn't realize I had. And amazingly enough, I'll share this story with you. I, I was a pole vaulter in high school, and I love pole vaulting. If I could still do it today, I would. And uh, nothing like a fat guy on a stick. Uh, but I really did enjoy it and uh, had a successful career. And then my senior year, I had some indoor meets that I'd gone to in Pittsburgh and some and Johnstown and some places I had gone, suffered some injury. And I'll never forget, uh, in fact, I still have the article today, the record Argus, my senior year I struggled in my abilities. I really struggled pole vaulting that last year because of the, I had suffered a concussion, I had, I had some other things. And, and I remember the record Argus stating in there, you know, we expected so much more from Jim Fleck this year than what he was able to perform. So I went on to, uh, I had qualified, I'd gone to the, the state qualifier, I placed 
to where I could go into the main qualifier. I had done well enough. I had set a personal record at that time, 12 feet, which was okay, good for me. But then the week of the, the state qualifier, I just struggled that week. And again, it was the mental thing. But you want to know what? For, for years after that, I battled that in my mind. Why? Because the enemy continued took me down that path and reminded me of my failure. And, uh, you know, I, I remember Marcia, you know, prom is always at the end of the year. How many of you guys went to prom? Anybody go to prom? How about online? Prom, you like that? Fancy stuff, fancy suits, all that. No, we didn't have limousines back then because uh, we just would go ahead and hitch up the buckboard and go. Uh, but, but Marcia always had to wait to the end. You know, we, she, she could never get a dress for prom because you never know if I go to state this year, I, you, you better wait. And, of course, it wouldn't go, and she'd have to find a dress. So for me, the, the, the struggle, the baggage that I have dealt with over the years has been this, this failure path. And that's the enemy that the enemy gets me on that path. And I don't know the path that each of you might be dealing with. But this morning, I'd like to give you some hope and some help. And uh, as myself, again, I have to continue to stay in the word and stay in relationship with Christ. Because again, the enemy will pull me back into that every single time. God wants to lead me down the path. And I think about Peter. You think about Peter for a moment and some of his failures. Remember, he sank in the water. Now, first of all, he stepped out and was on top of it. Forget that. He sank. He cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. I don't know if you know this or not. Some of the ancient translations say his name was, huh? Um, but... <laughs> Jesus, of course, healed, put the ear back on, healed him. But, you know, the, bigger, the big sticker for him was he denied Jesus. Can you believe it? He denied Christ. But you want to know something? God redeemed him and set him free of baggage. Peter went on to be very, a very successful minister for the gospel, sharing the truth of God's word with people and uh, developing into a mighty man of God. How about Paul? Paul was a Christian hater, a persecutor of the church. But yet God got a hold of his life and he became a new person. He became one of the greatest missionaries we have ever known. So this morning I want to offer you a solution to your baggage and that comes from Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30. Jesus in talking to the crowds, ministering to them on various subjects, comes to this statement. He said in verse 28 of Matthew 11, Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Message Bible puts it this way for us. Are you tired? Okay, thumbs up from those online. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. An invitation. Christ gives us an invitation. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So Christ gives you an invitation to come. And one of the things I want you to understand this morning is this. We so often, when it comes to the gospel and proclaiming the gospel, we have one goal in mind, and that's to get people into heaven. We want you to be saved. We want you to come to know Christ. But how many of you realize that your salvation is much more than that? It's bigger than just getting to heaven. And it's bigger than just praying that you hold out to the end. Life is, there's more to life than all those things. Jesus says, come to me, you that are, what? Laboring and heavy laden. The word labor means what you put on yourself. You take it on your own strengths, your own powers. The words heavy laden means what other people put on you. What they place on you. The church is notorious for that, are we not? Think about what we've done to people over the years. I pick the word out, holiness. Holy, be ye holy for I am holy. And then what happened is we took that word and we ran with it. 
there was a time period when holy meant this. Ladies, you wore dresses that you had the capability of play, spraying pledge on the bottom and then dusting wooden floors with it. Your sleeves were to your wrists. Your neckline was up over your, you're like the bazooka bubblegum guy. You're up here, you can't see anything with your eyes. Guys, black suit, white, white shirt, black tie, black shoes, black socks. That's holiness and a black belt on top of it. When we were pastoring in Hermitage, we had one woman who said holiness was not, you ladies, not wearing open-toed shoes. How many unholy women are here this morning? Yes, there they are. Ye sinners, ye. But again, for, for her, in, in that, that age bracket, they, 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 they interpreted things, and, and they put that over on people to where it wasn't fun coming to church anymore. It wasn't a time to celebrate. It was keeping all the rules and regulations. Has not the church, has not the original Jews been the same way? They've, impre they've oppressed people with all that junk in their lives. Jesus, in writing in Luke chapter 4, puts these words down. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. The word anointment means empowered me, enabled me. He's empowered me to bring good news to the poor. Listen to this next section. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. Verse 19, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Verse 20, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, sat down, all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. They're waiting. They're waiting. What's next? Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. And they didn't get it. They missed it. They didn't realize what Jesus came to do. He came to set people free so that they no longer had to be bound up by baggage, but that they could let that stuff go. They could go ahead and lay it at the foot of the cross. They could turn it over to him, and he would redeem them. The Message Bible puts verses 18 and 19 like this. God's Spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. Listen to this next part. To set the burdened or those with baggage and battered free. So if you've, got, if you've got baggage, if you're burdened this morning, if you're battered and beat up, if you're challenged with life, Jesus came along to set you free. Love the last song. It's, it's neat how the Holy Spirit works. Last night in the music, it all worked with the message. They don't know what I'm preaching about. They, we don't tell them. It's a secret till the very end or the very beginning. But all the music last night, the songs before my message and the song after my message, didn't tell them what I'm preaching on, came right in. Pastor Greg this morning, exact same thing. The message there right before the, what is it? I am who you say I am. What's that about? It's about living in our freedom in Christ. It's about accepting the work that he's done. It's about laying our baggage at the foot of the cross, coming into relationship with him, and being free from the bondages of this world. Something we can be excited about. Listen, folks, we can walk in freedom. That's what God has purposed for us. Jesus said in John 8, chapter 31 and, or verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, God has always been against bondage. He does not like bondage. He sent Moses in to deliver the children of Israel. He's given us his word that we might walk in freedom. And as Paul was addressing the church of Galatia, he was addressing something. They, what they had done is they began to fall back into bondage to the law, the, the law of man and ceremonies and rituals. 
And Paul scolds them and lets them know, you don't need to walk down this path. This is not the direction I've guided you and taught you in. Turn around, come back. As he shares with them in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He did not want them to fall back into the attitude of religiosity in their life that they would suddenly have to live by works again and not by the grace of God. I believe that can apply to us as well when it comes to the fact that God does not want you to be bound in your past. God does not want you to be bound in your baggage. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be able to walk in the liberty that he has provided for you. Verse 2, Paul says, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What's he saying here? Ouch. No, that's not what he's saying at all. What he's telling us to this is if you, try to, if you try to live under bondage, you will never walk in the freedom that Christ has given to you. And again, being able to apply that to the fact that we have baggage at times, we cannot walk in freedom if we continue to walk under those stipulations and standards that we set in our own mind. It's time to be free, people. And why do we want to be free? He addresses that later on in the chapter in verses 13 and 14 of Galatians 5. 5. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Folks, sometimes the reason that we don't step into service for God is we're hanging to so much baggage, baggage, we don't think we have the ability or the qualification to help someone else. But what you have to understand is you can be free of that. And then those things become a learning experience, something for you to associate with others who are going through the exact same thing that you're going under or, and through. We can be set free from those things by the power of the gospel. But what God is saying here through Paul is he's letting us know that once we're free and we're in that liberty, it's time to begin to step out and serve each other in love. You know, I asked you that early on, how many of you feel that you've got baggage in your life? Let me see these hands again. God wants you to be free. And then he wants you to take that experience that you have and share it with someone else that's going through the exact same thing. I'd like to invite the worship team to come if they would at this time. You know, as I was preparing this message, and I would started a month ago, just, it just really hit me. I knew this was the direction that I wanted to go. Um, I thought about a hymn, not a her, a hymn that... Uh, the church sings, and it's the hymn, At the Cross. And the chorus goes like this, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my sins rolled away. All right, let's replace that word burden with baggage, and the baggage of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith that I received my faith, my, my sight, and now I am happy all the day. This morning, after Pastor Greg finish up, finishes up with this last song, the pastors and our prayer partners are going to be here in the front. Listen, if you're dealing with something in your life, I'm inviting you to come down and let us pray for you. Let us stand in faith with you so that you can get over these things and you can move on in your relationship with Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those, and Lord, those that raise their hand this morning that feel that they're still dealing with baggage in their life. Lord, I pray that you would set them free. And that, Lord, just as that last song that we sang, they'll realize that they need to begin seeing that I am who you say I am. Not who I say I am, but who you say I am. You say I'm a child of God. You say, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, you speak positivity over us. You speak life and deliverance over each and every one of us. So, Father, my prayer this morning is that people will be set free 
from the power of, of baggage in their life. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just stand together. Let's just declare that hymn together that Pastor Jim was talking about. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart was rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. I love these verses. This is how they go. Sing alas and deep my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I at the crossing at the cross? Cross where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart was rolled away. Oh, it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes? Was together but drops of grief can faithful and he is good if you're visiting and watching and a part of our online community and you want to drop your baggage just drop it there are guys monitoring the chat and chatting with you and let's leave the baggage I've traveled 2.4 million miles in 30 years and I can tell you one thing lighter baggage is easier than heavy baggage I promise you may the Lord bless you may the Lord keep you may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you how about let's have the greatest week ever in Jesus name Amen. Be blessed.